I'm Sam Moses. Uh, I help bands finish their record and bring peace of mind in the process. And the more technical term would be mastering engineer. How am I going to top that? That's 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 a great answer. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I would say I would say I'm a master engineer. I help people just make the record sound as best as they possibly can on multiple different platforms wherever they want to wherever they want to release them. So, yeah. mastering engineer. What a loaded question. Mastering, I would say, is where you need. You you have you have production to where you're putting all of the pieces of the pie into a DAW onto tape, whatever medium you want to have them. You have mixing that then incorporates all of those individual elements into a song, and then you have mastering, which prepares um, that song for distribution. It's final home. It's final resting place where the where the majority of everybody is going to love it and. Uh, essentially preparing it for that medium. So whether that's going to be vinyl, whether that's going to be cassettes are coming back, whether that's uh, just sitting on a streaming platform and just taking up the, taking up the downloads. Um, mastering is preparing that, but ultimately it's, I believe like the, helping the artist to finally reach that level of this is the final product. This is what, I intended for this to sound like this whole time. And this is like the final realization of that song. I'm, I'm basically getting hired to call a record done or not. So at this stage, 12 years into it, that's my value. So if someone sends me a mix, they're stoked on. If it needs to be louder, that's fine. If that will, help us get to the end product that they want and compete in the medium, which is mainly digital at this stage for most people, Spotify, playlisting, then we may make it louder. When we say louder, we're talking about compression, limiting usually. So we're making everything in that mix more loud more often. So I make sure that client understands when we say we want it louder, when you say you want it louder, we're going to make everything more loud more often. Now that can bring energy, excitement, or that can also sometimes kill the vibe of what they've already got. So that's my job, in my opinion, is I'll listen to the mix. And sometimes we do a thousand things to it. And sometimes we do one thing to it. We really get paid for the millions of things we don't do, in my opinion, at mastering. It's having the restraint to not use the 20 pieces of analog mastering gear or a thousand plugins to know what a song really needs. And sometimes what a song really needs is my experience of doing thousands and thousands of records at this stage and going, I actually know this will compete. The mix is great. That's my best case scenario. What I tell you, like I want the mix to come to me and me basically be like, I don't think there's anything I need to do, but what I'm doing is mental. It's knowing from this experience of having records come out and then, also proof of concept that a lot of records I work on do well. So people like them, but a lot of that it, mastering so misunderstood because it involves everyone. Like my success is we've talked about it on our podcast, Matt and I, our success is dependent on our community. So I'm only as good as my mixer, producer, writer, and song. So a lot of the times I feel like I have the best job <laughs> because everybody's already done 98% of the hard work. I just help people understand what they're asking. And then I try and help communicate with them and, and learn when someone says, I want it to be loud. What does that mean to them? These days I do believe it's, you know, it's kind of like going into Baskin Robbins. It's like, you got however many players in front of you and that's the mastering engineer you were going to pick for that job. And do I think that uh, one mastering engineer can do all genres? Sure. Um, there's a handful of genres that I don't really take just because I don't think that I'm the best fit for. I say that very openly on our podcast. Sam says there's certain things that he doesn't really care for. In all honesty, it might just be preferential taste. It might be whatever. But, you know, it's nice to be able to say, hey, you know what? This isn't really my field. But I also have a saying that I don't like to create a problem without offering a solution. 
And so if it's a hip hop project, I'm not honestly the best fit for it. It's just not a genre I connect with, but Sam is absolutely in love with hip hop. And so I will recommend that person to Sam. On the flip side, Sam's not the biggest jazz fan. I absolutely love jazz. I'll be driving a Jeep Wrangler in Charleston, South Carolina, listening to jazz. I'm 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 kind of weird like that. Um, and so I have no problem taking on any of those projects. So it's just flavor, and I think you have now more variety. So long as you go with somebody who is who definitely knows what they're doing and isn't just um, just slapping a bunch of plugins that say mastering at the end of them on the chain, I think you can achieve a consistent result. Um, I mean, not not trying to, to plug a product here, but I mean, I think that is what's nice about, say, what Lynx does is you do have a consistent product because you are using professional grade equipment that is going to deliver a consistent result. And every time you go through that DA and AD, you know what you're going to get. I can say in the last, I mean, the last, yeah, five years probably of having the Hilo. I mean, everything I've done has either been monitored or ran through it. So if you go on my website to my discography, the selected one, everything on there is going to be at some point auditioned or put through the Hilo. Specific projects. It's so hard because I like so many of the records I work on, thankfully. I mean, a lot of the records lately that I guess people will be have been coming to me for have been like stuff by Joan, uh, Nightly, stuff with Fly By Midnight, Jake Miller. It's like all this pop, these new pop, indie rock pop guys um, that I've been working on their records and, and they pretty much all get mixed by Matt Huber, who's an insane mixer. I have to shout him out. Um because he makes me sound really good <laughs> and he makes Link sound really good. The links to me is just like, it's so necessary for my workflow because it's just clean and transparent and something I can trust. And I know every record that I work on, if I start with the links, what I'm hearing is correct. And there's no coloring in my opinion. I remember when I was researching converters and Matt got me on the Hilo, but even after like researching the Hilo and listening to shootouts and auditioning it against stuff, a lot of the criticism on the internet actually was were people saying the Hilo sounds sterile and boring. <laughs> like, and like as if it was a problem, as if that meant it was cheap or something. And I immediately was like, well, isn't that what we want? <laughs> Why, you know, we criticize like hyped up monitors that are not accurate. We criticize all sorts of things, rooms, you know, Beats headphones, which all those things I enjoy. I think they're fun to, to work and listen on. But the Hilo just kept for many years. And Matt, I think, would agree with this. Matt and I have converted, no pun intended. Oh my gosh, converted. <laughs> so many people to change their story on the Hilo because on the forums it always got beat up of just being this like workhorse boring sterile, sterile converter and then people started to be like well that's what I want then I want to you know because then I can use tubes and Pultex and vintage stuff and color the heck out of it the Hilo like I don't think I'll ever change like at this stage, there's nothing it doesn't do. And the routing is bonkers on it in a good way. Um, and the ability to continually update the software kind of makes it like, like it's not going to die out in theory if the updates keep coming. So it's, I've never, I've literally never had an issue with it in five years. And that's probably been, a total of like eight to 9,000 songs. Yeah. Um, I pulled up a little discography. It's like, it, it's, it's exactly the same as what Sam said. I have used it on just about everything for about five or six years. I think it's going on just about six years. Um, I mean, some of my favorite projects, I do a lot of indie stuff and however far they get is however far they want to push it. 
um, indie's kind of my realm and what I really live in. And specifically indie that is like really big home to the Southeast, uh, Southeast United States, uh, rare creatures, uh, Sarah Burns, human resources. One of my, uh, one of my favorite bands to, to master for, uh, doom flamingo. They're fun. They're, they are everywhere. Um, St. Joan, uh, hello Kelly. They're a uh, Canadian band, Grace and little, uh, Tom McCall. I mean, the list, the list really goes, goes kind of forever. Um, I mean, not forever. Um, 87 nights, another great one. Easy honey. Um, yeah, I, I love everyone that I, that I work with. What, where'd this come from? Oh, <laughs> oh excuse me. <laughs> podcast called the attack early show number one number two i have to give all credit to matt like the podcast would not exist well i guess i get credit before that and that i used to like do more mentoring (laughs) let me take the credit uh and matt was somebody i got to mentor and he had approached me about learning more about the business side of things and kind of client relationships more than the, the technical side. Um, and I've always thought Matt's been a very gifted master engineer from day one. Um, but after we kind of got done with our like mentoring, I don't know how long it was, like six months or so, Matt. Um my recollection is Matt said, Hey, would you want to do a podcast where we basically cover everything we just covered? You know, we would talk on the phone for an hour or two hours. And Matt was like, why don't we just do that again and have a microphone in front of us? And I think I remember saying like, okay, um, sounds like a fun idea. I think Matt had already done a podcast before cigars and things. Um, Matt's the most interesting man on the planet. (laughs) Um, But I said, you know, I'll do one episode. It's got to be fun and easy and like stress free. And so we did one episode on pirated software (laughs) was the first one we ever did, which no one had ever to our knowledge done an episode on like pros and cons of stealing software, basically. (laughs) And it was fun. And Matt and I's dialogue I thought was great. And, uh, the rest is history. Like we're five years into it going on six. I always are kind of like underground joke. At least I feel like I have with people's and people agree is like, we're not the largest podcast, but we're like the most respected in the audio world. Um, And there's a lot of big time dudes that have said, you know, they love the podcast. They think we're doing good work and like being a good voice for, um, demystifying the industry and really being as honest we as we can about this is how records actually get made this is the ins and outs of it this is what's important about it here's like what's really going on with loudness here's what's really going on with how you invoice a client (laughs) like here's what it's like to work with labels not always great (laughs) you know not always the highest paying does it does it even matter there's all sorts of things that we've gone into and continue to go into but yeah, the podcast really, I mean, it's the same with the Hilo. Like Matt is like my, I call him my life curator. So almost all things good in the last like five or six years of my life that I really love Matt has curated for me. And then the other thing I'll say about our podcast is like, we're pure in that we thus far, like we have turned down all sponsorships. We've turned down like, Anybody who's ever wanted to give us money or get their name through our podcast, we kind of, we started this podcast with no intention of ever wanting or needing it to make money. So there's no monetization. The only money, and I think we broke even was we did merchandise one year for Christmas. And that was like audience generated. They're like, just make some merch. And like a hundred people bought it. And then we never did it again. (laughs) And we might do it again. 